great pleasure to introduce to you our speaker today. He has his whole fan club here. They, they don't need to hear about it, but, um, and I think half the teachers in Maslin are here too, so they, <laughs> either he got passed around or he was very popular. Um, Doug is a program specialist at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of African American History and Culture. Here we are in Black History Month. Aren't we lucky to have him here? He joined that staff in 2014 to assist in developing the museum's slate of inaugural publications, and oh my, the things that I've seen are absolutely stunning. Since then, he has coordinated the publication of 12 books and numerous, on that's two years, three or four years, it's, that's huge. Um, in 12 books and numerous online features while managing all copyright clearances and distribution of images and information, relating to objects in the museum's collection. That means he's an extremely organized person. <laughs> Doug grew up in Maslin, graduating from 2009. Uh, as we approach this year's big read, um, I, I would like to tell you that my first encounter with Doug was uh, we have one-act plays, original one-act plays every year, and I remember he starred in some of them in our Sorry. very early years. So I can tell you from that performance that he's going to be a very engaging speaker. Um, Doug earned both an MA in Media and Public Affairs and a BA in Political Communication from the George Washington University in Washington, D.C., and he's here with us today from Washington, D.C. Thank you, Doug, for being here. Thanks, Marty, and Nancy, and everybody at the museum, and everybody here today. Um, it's really exciting to come back and uh, to share some of the work that I've been doing um, at the museum in DC, and to feature some things that I've come across during my time there relating to uh, Ohio, and especially some really interesting things about Aslan that I've found. So, um, as Marty said, I graduated uh, from Washington High School in 2009, um, and moved to Washington, D.C., uh, studied politics and communications, and soon realized it's not exactly what I wanted to do with my life. Um, while I was in college, I worked for the National Archives um, and really developed this love of history that I've always had, um, but made some connections and joined the staff at the museum uh, in 2014 after I finished grad school. So, um, <clears throat> as Marty mentioned, I was brought in to work on the museum's publications. Um, so this included uh, some of the books that we came out with when the museum opened, um, including big coffee table books, books about the founding of the museum, the history of the museum. Um, within the last year, we just came out with a cookbook. Um, the Cafe in the Museum is actually a James Beard-nominated Best New Restaurant, um, and the recipes are all from uh, the Cafe in the Museum that you can eat there every day. Um, in addition to that, I've been involved in a seven-part series focusing on the museum's photography collection. Um, these are the books you can kind of see along the bottom here. Uh, they look at different topics, have about 50 to 60 images in them, and there's a small team, about five of us, that work on these books, and we look at the images. Um, we spend some time, actually, with the collection at our warehouse, pulling out 150-year-old images, um, looking at them, determining you know what works best for the subject area, the, the books that we're working on at the time. Um, I work with outside authors, I work with curators, I do some of my own writing, um, and we work with the designers, every process of the publications um, I have a hand in. And it's, it's really been um, my favorite part about working at the museum to, uh, at the end of the day, have something physical that you can show um, and, and take home and, and share with people. So on top of the, the digital, or the uh, print publishing that I work on, we also do a lot of digital publishing. Um, one of these uh, takes form in what we call collection stories. These are online features that feature objects in the museum's collection. Um, when curators are bringing objects in, collections in, they do hours and hours and hours of research on, on one object or a collection of objects. And if the object is going on display, we often only have 50 to 75 words to talk about it. So these, these uh, online stories give curators and staff a chance to share that knowledge, that research that they've conducted um, in a way that's extremely visual heavy, focuses on the objects, um, but still takes a little bit of a scholarly tone. Um, one of the exciting parts about this project is that it's not just curators who uh, work on these stories, we also have 
research staff, uh, conservators, um, our interns, uh, when they work with us, they each end up writing a story, and it's something that they can take home with them and point to uh, going forward in their careers as something that they, they researched and wrote while working with us at the museum. So uh, before I get started on talking about the actual building itself and, and some of the collections, I want to tell you a quick story and show a, a short video clip. Um, in 2009, the museum partnered with the Library of Congress on a project called the Civil Rights History Project. Um, this was a federally funded project that aimed to conduct oral history interviews with people who are active in the civil rights movements in the 1960s. Um, dozens of interviews have been collected um, over the past uh, about 10 years. And one of those interviews was with a gentleman, Charles McDew, who was born and raised in Madison, Ohio. Um, McDew, as I said, was born, born in Maslin. Um, he went south uh, to attend college at South Carolina State University. And when he first traveled south to go to college, he encountered segregation for the first time. Um, throughout his interview, he talks about his role uh, in the civil rights movement, um, first with uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and then in the founding of uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC. Um, he became the second president of SNCC from 1960 to 1963. Um, and throughout his interview, he talks about his, ex his experiences in the civil rights movement. However, uh, in the about hour and a half long interview, he continually goes back and talks about his upbringing in Maslin. Um, so I just want to show a very short clip um, to kind of highlight one of these people from Maslin um, and, and their influence on the building of the museum. I was born in Massillon, Ohio, June 23rd, 1938. Um, Massillon is a community of about 35, 36,000 people. Um, it's generally known for the production of steel and uh, football players. My father had played for Paul Brown um, and the Mass and Tigers. I grew up playing for Local 1124, uh, United Steel Workers. You grew up playing for, for steel mill sponsored, union sponsored teams. Uh, everybody worked that worked, worked in, in, in the steel mill. What school was like up there? Well, school, I think the schools were very good. Um, in fact, my, my sister um, was one of the first black teachers um, in the Madison Public School. The schools were highly integrated. You know, you, you went to, you go to class with the kids in your uh, really a town of, of worker immigrants. It was a, uh, an immigrant culture. People came from all over the world to work in the steel mills. Madison was very much an expression of the American dream. That uh, people came from different cultures. Uh, there was the majority of the people who made up mass were immigrants and the sons and daughters of immigrants from different cultures, from Greece, from Spain, uh, from Yugoslavia, from Czechoslovakia, and from the American South. The people who came from the American South were just as much immigrants uh, as the people who came from Czechoslovakia. As I got older, I understood that Madison, Ohio was very much uh, the American dream. So when, when Margie had asked me to come, come talk today, um, I had known about him. I had you know, I'd run searches in our collections and our databases to find you know, anything related to Maslin um, during my time there. I've always been been curious. And I knew about this interview, but I never fully watched it. Um, so a couple months ago, I, I watched the interview. And you know, in the first five minutes, 
seeing these words um, were really powerful and I just wanted to make sure I shared them with you guys all today before I uh, really go into the, the meat of the, the museum itself. So the museum actually first came about almost 100 years ago. Um, in the early 20th century, a group of Civil War veterans, um, including many veterans from Northeast Ohio, uh, were involved in an effort to build what was then called the National Negro Memorial. Um, you can see on the left here uh, the proposed design for the memorial in Washington, D.C. And um, the object on the top there is actually part of the museum's collection. It's a small little coin bank that was used for fundraising purposes. Um, unfortunately, the Great Depression came and uh, the push to create the museum kind of fizzled out. And over the next 40, 50 years or so, um, there, were, there was some small work happening, but the movement really grew into the 70s and 80s. Um, and in the 1990s, um, spearheaded by Representative John Lewis, uh, the museum uh, effort to build a national museum really picked up. And in 2003, uh, Congress, both houses of Congress passed an act to build the National Museum of African American History and Culture and to place it under the umbrella of the Smithsonian Institution. Um, President Bush signed the legislation in 2003, uh, surrounded by members of Congress and members of an advisory committee that was brought in to, to determine exactly what form this would take. So an act of Congress is great, but there was nothing else. There was no director, there was no staff, there was no building, there was no location, and there were no objects. Um, and there was only half the funding needed. <laughs> so a lot of work had to be done um, in the next 13 years before the museum could be open. So the first, step, the first step was to find a location and select some architects. So you can see on the left here, um, a commission was created uh, to select the final location. They looked at five different spots around uh, the downtown Washington, D.C. area and eventually selected the spot that's circled here in this image. Um, this is the last available uh, spot of land on the National Mall. Um, it's next to the National Museum of American History in the shadow of the Washington Monument and right across the street from the White House. Um, the image on the right here is of the three main architects of the building, David Adjay, Max Bond, and Phil Freelon, um, looking at the space and starting to determine how, how the museum will take shape. Now, probably the biggest question I get about the museum is why does it look like it looks? Um, it does not look like a marble, neoclassical building like every other building on the National Mall, and that was very purposeful. Um, the, the director and the, the committee that selected the architects knew from the beginning that they wanted this to stand out, to be a monument uh, to the African-American experience. And so the, the image on the left is actually the original sketch by David Adjay, uh, who designed the facade of the building, um, and, and, and shows the different, different sides of the building itself. Um, the the three-tiered corona, what we call the outside of the building itself, is, is modeled in a way to make people feel like it's rising up out of the ground, that it's, it's lifting up. And it's modeled after this Yoruban statue you can see in the middle here, uh, which is a carving that was used as uh, a column to hold up a uh, front porch in African culture. Um, the the three-tiered corona is modeled off of this crown at the top of the statue uh, to reflect back to African culture. And then the, the actual panels, the corona panels on the side of the building are individual panels. There's, there's thousands of them on the side of the building and the filigree design of them is made to reflect um, the, the ironwork that was done by enslaved African Americans in Charleston and New Orleans that you can still see today. So as I mentioned, you know, the museum was created um, and it had no collection, zero objects. Um, the first objects didn't start coming into the collection until 2006. Uh, and within 10 years, uh, the museum, museum had amassed a collection of over 30,000 objects. Um, some of these objects are, are wow objects, really exciting objects, and some are simple things that still, still are very important. Um, objects came through both through private donations from uh, individuals, family members, 
uh, collectors, as well as some strategic pur uh, purchases to, to fill in some gaps. So some examples of some of these, these key images include uh, the dress that Rosa Parks was sewing the day she was arrested as part of the Montgomery bus boycott, um, a silk lace and linen shawl that was given to Harriet Tubman by Queen Victoria and passed down through uh, her descendants, uh, through her great nieces, and then this painting here in the center uh, by Kehinde Wiley. Kinde Wiley is the artist who recently painted President Obama's official portrait that was unveiled at the National Portrait Gallery last year. Um, the museum has also used both private funds and uh, federally available funds made for uh, collections acquisitions to purchase some important objects as well. Um, these include a trumpet owned by Louis Armstrong, um, an actual airplane that is on display in the museum that was used to train uh, Tuskegee Airmen during World War II. And my personally favorite object, uh, <laughs> the Ohio State helmet that was worn and signed by Archie Griffin while he was at Ohio State. Um, so these objects, uh, like I said, when the museum opened, we had around 30,000 objects in the collection. Um, about 2,500 of those are, were put on display when the museum opened. Um, the museum is divided up into th roughly three categories, uh, groupings of exhibitions, um, history, community, and culture, and the objects fit into those as well. So on the top floor of the museum, you have the culture exhibitions. These include uh, the visual arts gallery. Uh, this takes the form of, of your typical art gallery. Um, taking the stage, which, which looks at uh, the contributions of African Americans uh, on, in the theater, uh, in film and in television. Uh, cultural expressions, which looks at both African Americans and the diaspora um, and focuses on foodways and artistry, uh, language, style, things like that. And then finally, musical crossroads, uh, which looks at the contributions of African Americans uh, to music. Uh, that exhibition includes both Chuck Berry's Red Cadillac and George Clinton's Mothership. So uh, a, few, a few objects from the culture collections that I wanted to highlight. Um, no one ever thought they'd see something like this together on a, on a slide. Um, <laughs> so the image on the left is actually, it's a painting by Robert Duncanson. Duncanson was a free African American man who lived in Cincinnati during uh, the middle of the 19th century. He's, he's recognized as the first internationally known African American artist. And this painting is of the Ohio River Valley and is on display in the Visual Arts Gallery. Um, and then on the right is an album uh, by the OJs. Um, and this can be found as a reproduction in the Musical Crossroads exhibition in a space called In the Record Store, where visitors to the museum can actually flip through reproductions of records like you were in a record store and play selected tunes on an interactive table in the middle of the room. So one floor down on the third floor of the museum are the community galleries. These include an exhibition about uh, African Americans in the military, um, an exhibition on athletes and sports um, and the role of athletes both on and off the field, uh, making a way out of no way, which looks at how over the course of American history, African Americans uh, use things like the press and religion and education, uh, fraternal and sororal organizations to make a way. And then in the center of the, the gallery space is an exhibition called Power of Place. This looks at 11 individual uh, locations, um, communities around the country at different times in America's history, and, and the African American communities in these specific places. So one of the most powerful uh, areas in the museum is the, the Medal of Honor lens. This is a small room off the side of the military exhibition, um, and it highlights um, each of the African American Medal of Honor recipients. Um, there's, a, there's a very large window at the far end that perfectly shapes the Washington Monument and looks over Arlington National Cemetery, and there's a small case in the center that holds the Medal of Honor that was, donate, uh, that was donated to the museum by the family of Cornelius Charlton, who received the Medal of Honor for his actions in the Korean War. On each side of the walls are plaques with photographs, if they were available, of the Medal of Honor recipients with information about them. 
Um, included on the right side of the wall is this plaque for Robert Pinn. Pinn was born in Stark County, lived in Perry Township, and worked on his family farm until he was 18. Uh, when the Civil War broke out, uh, he joined the Union Army and served as a first sergeant in Company I of the 5th Regiment. He was awarded the, the Medal of Honor um, during the Battle of Chaffin's Farm in Virginia in September of 1864. And his official citation reads, Pinn took command of his company after all of the officers had been killed or wounded and gallantly led it in battle. Pinn would return from the Civil War would attend Oberlin College, would become a teacher uh, both in Ohio and South Carolina, and would eventually return to Maslin, uh, sit for the Ohio Bar, and become a lawyer here in Maslin. And I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about football. <laughs> um, <clears throat> in, the, in the sports gallery, there are uh, a number of uh, objects and images relating to Ohio and, and football. Um, while the image on the left is not currently on display, it is in the collection and is of Horace Gillum, who's from Maslin. Um, he, he played under Paul Brown at all three levels, uh, at Maslin, at Ohio State, and for the Cleveland Browns. Um, on the right is an image of Marion Motley. Uh, this image is reproduced uh, very large in the exhibition. Um, Motley played for Kent McKinley. Uh, he, uh, went to college in Nevada before uh, becoming one of the first two African Americans to play professional football in the modern era. Uh, while at McKinley, uh, Motley's team went 25-3 and three, with all three losses coming to Paul Brown and the Tigers. <laughs> and finally in the middle here we have a signed jersey uh, worn and signed by Jim Brown. Um, this is part of a a case that talks about Jim Brown and his legacy both on and off the field. And the final uh, grouping of exhibitions in the museum are the history galleries. These are really the meat of the museum. Um, the history galleries are all located below ground um, and three floors below ground at the museum and take up about 60% of the space and the content in the museum. Um, they, they flow chronologically, and in order to see them, you take an elevator three floors down below ground and start uh, in the 1400s with the beginning of the slave trade. In the exhibition Slavery and Freedom, uh, you'll work your way through the advent of the slave trade through the Middle Passage into colonial America, um, through the Revolutionary War, uh, the abolitionist movements, uh, into the Civil War, and finally, emancipation. Uh, you'll then work your way up to Defending Freedom, Defining Freedom, uh, which is an exhibition about the segregation era, roughly uh, the 100 years between uh, 1865 and 1968. And these exhibition, this exhibition focuses on uh, life uh, in segregated America, both in the North and the South, um, looks at organizations, religion, um, talks about the Great Migration, uh, the World Wars, and, and finally uh, culminates in, in the modern civil rights movement. At the end of the exhibition, uh, there's a large, you can see in the image here, interactive table where visitors can sit down uh, and interact with, with questions uh, posed to, to visitors um, to make it uh, bring to life what would happen if you were taking part in the sit-in uh, during, during the Civil Rights Movement. Um, you're, you're provided with scenarios, uh, questions, what would happen if, um, and, it, and it's a very, very powerful experience. And you can't see it in the picture here, but behind that area is actually a full-size uh, segregated Pullman rail car that you can walk along and look inside, uh, showing the differences um, in the white and the black sections in a, in a segregated car in the south. Um, this rail car was actually lowered into the museum while the museum was being built. It was created around and the entire structure was built around the car. So the car will be there um, forever. <laughs> Any changes to the museum will be built around that rail car. And finally, you'll work your way up uh, to the third of the three history galleries uh, called A Changing America 1968 and Beyond. And this area looks at uh, 
how America has changed since the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, it focuses on the Black Power Movement, on the Vietnam War, and works its way into the 80s, 90s uh, to today with a focus on Oprah, on uh, Barack Obama, and uh, black politicians uh, in the recent eras. So some, some objects here to highlight from this, from this section <laughs> include um, this class of 1892 Oberlin Academy prep school photo. In the top right corner is Eva Dyson. She attended Oberlin Prep on the Avery Scholarship for African American Women and would eventually go on to attend Oberlin College on the same uh, scholarship and, and became a teacher in Indiana after graduating. Uh, the image on the left here is of, of Chuck McDew from Maslin alongside Lorraine Hansberry, Nina Simone, Theodore Beckel, and James Foreman. Uh, they were in New York during the rally for the Freedom Riders in the 60s. And then finally, um, as I mentioned, there's, there's an area in the A Changing America Gallery that talks about African American politicians uh, in the late 60s and 70s. And included in, included in that are bumper stickers and buttons for Carl Stokes' mayoral campaign uh, in Cleveland in 1967. So in addition to the objects, uh, the exhibitions, the museum is involved in, in a lot of other, other things. Um, I mentioned before the Civil Rights History Project. Um, there are a couple other initiatives that, that I'd just like to highlight real quick. Um, one is called the Slave Rights Project. This is a, a joint uh, project between the museum, the Ezeko Museums in South Africa, George Washington University, and a few other organizations with a goal of researching and discovering uh, sunken slave wrecks um, around the world. Um, since its inception in the late, uh, around 2007, um, they have located a, a sunken slave wreck actually right off the coast of South Africa. You can see in the image here how close the wreck actually was. Um, they identified objects uh, from the hull of the ship and a number of other objects, brought them to the surface, and as part of the project, uh, the teams of both divers and curators uh, work with the local museums in the area to teach uh, students and, and museum professionals how to conserve these objects, how to talk about these objects. Um, and it's brought together a, a global conversation, not just here in America, but in South Africa, and the project is currently working in the Caribbean on, a, on, a, on locating another ship. And it's, and it's become a, a global project uh, focused on recounting the history of global slavery. The other project I'd like to, hire, or I'd like to highlight is um, a project that I'm extremely involved in, which is the Freedmen's Bureau Transcription Project. Um, this project aims to transcribe and make words searchable um, all two million records of the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands. Um, these uh, records were created by the Freedmen's Bureau. The Freedmen's Bureau was the reconstruction era government agency that was put in place to help assimilate and to provide for uh, newly freed African Americans in the South. Um, the records that are created include court records, ration records, medical records, um, and are a trove of genealogical information uh, for people who have ancestors that lived throughout the South uh, during the Reconstruction era. Um, there are, like I said, two million records that we will be transcribing um, in the coming decades. Um, <laughs> the, the public does all of this work, um, and to date we've done uh, 35,000 pages uh, in the last year and a half. So it, it seems like a small number, but the, the amount of data that's already become available uh, for people doing research on the Reconstruction Era, for uh, people who are trying to do genealogical research is, is really, really impressive. So as you can see, um, Ohio, and especially this era, area, really has played an important role um, in the history and culture of African Americans in our country. Uh, from Civil War veterans to members of the Civil Rights Movement, um, from monetary and object donors to employees. Um, you know, the National Museum of African American History and Culture could not be what it, what, what it is today without the contributions of people from Ohio in this area. 
So thank you. So um, the, the director of the museum and, and the staff, uh, when building the museum, toured many of the uh, African American museums, uh, local museums around the country. Um, and I, you know, I can't speak uh, for the director personally, but I do know that um, staff at these museums were consulted and um, were brought in to, to help and, and determine some of this, the content at the museum. ago where during the winter months, I'm gonna, October through February, um, tickets are not needed during the week. Um, tickets are still needed on the weekends. Um, and during the museum's busy months, which include uh, the spring because of school groups and cherry blossoms, um, through the summer, uh, so April through September, tickets are still needed. They're released on the museum's website uh, three months in advance on the first Wednesday of the month. Um, during the weeks, they also do walk-ups um, starting at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So if you are in town during the week and don't have a ticket, uh, you can walk up uh, starting at 1 in the afternoon, and depending on crowd size in the museum, they let people in, and it's usually not much of an issue. Yeah? I might have missed it, but did you say when the museum opened? Sure, so I may not have. <laughs> uh, the museum opened in September of 2016. So we, uh, about 13 years after it was chartered, um, about 10 years after the first staff and first objects came in, um, and we've now been open almost two and a half years and have seen over five million visitors during that time, which is why we still have tickets. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, the museum's website is nmaahc.si.edu. Um, I'll throw it up here afterwards. Um, and on the museum's website, you can view approximately a third of the collection is available online, um, including images of objects. Um, the collection stories that I talked about are all available on the museum's website. You can watch uh, the Civil Rights History Project videos um, on the website and read about the exhibitions, the programs, the initiatives, all of that.
Now, I'm wondering if um, we wanted to get this collection to the African American Museum, if you could go past your own local community because a lot of this stuff is good stuff. Mm -hmm. How would you go about doing it? Just contact the library or will we contact you? So the, the museum does suggest um, to contact your, your local uh, museums, libraries, places like that first, because uh, you know those are the places that that will um, use and and care for those objects. Um, you are able to to donate objects to uh, the National Museum. Um, it's it's a lengthy process. Um, we get thousands of donation requests a week, um, and they're all reviewed. Um, they're all responded to, um, and what pretty much happens is you'll fill out a form, um, and a curator will respond to you on whether or not it's something that they're they're interested in bringing in. But maybe Margie can talk about what to do here. <laughs> Mandy is standing in the back, going, "Bring it on!" <laughs> Our archivist Mandy Ultimus Stahl is on maternity leave, but she loves this place so much she's here today, anyhow, and. Um, she, it's the same procedure. You call, you make an appointment, so that she, if it's our, if it's flat stuff, it's Mandy, and, and we're, we're, well, we will have another curator uh, before long. But right now, she, as of March first, she'll be your your woman, and uh, make an appointment with her so she can allot the time that your wonderful things deserve, and so she can talk with you and figure out what to do and what all the right procedures are. So. Just call the museum and you ask for Mandy Stahl. Because I think in the African American community, we see the same people that it's been recycled sure. year after year after year. And there's so many more that have helped build Absolutely. this community with some of the contributions that they've made. And so you end up just going to the African American church and so the kids can learn. So one thing um, that we found when the, the staff at the museum was collecting uh, for the, the new uh, exhibitions is that you know it's it's okay to tell stories without iconic objects. It's um, in fact it was a great way for the curators to bring in some of these these family heirlooms. These um, one of one of the most powerful objects in the museum is a small tin wallet that, that held and still holds uh, the folded up uh, freedom papers that, that belonged to a gentleman in Loudoun County, Virginia. Um, he built this wallet himself um, because those papers were his freedom and, and he had to care for them because that was everything. And those papers were passed down through the family um, and donated to the museum by the gentleman's great granddaughter. Um, and, and those those family heirlooms allow the museum to tell a larger story um, about um, free African Americans during slavery. So in addition to our museum, there is the National Museum of African Art, um, and the uh, National Museum of American History also has, has exhibitions on African Americans. Yeah. Uh, Chucky McDo is my next door neighbor about 30 years. Uh, I used to wait on Horse Yellow at the Boston Lunch. And I still remember, he was a dollar kid. <laughs> How many of you are going to rush home and try to get tickets? <laughs> <laughs> you just couldn't have 
hit us spot on any better. This is exactly what we wanted to hear today and what we wanted to see. Your visuals are beautiful. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you all for coming, and you know, you can come back every month. You don't just have to come with me. We have this really special speaker. See you next month.